want to talk a little bit about um, how we think about variant pathogenicity interpretation in a more quantitative sense. And so I'm going to talk uh, today a little bit about what I call Bayes 101, uh, which is the uh, probabilistic theory that we use. Uh, and uh, what I want to do is do this in a fun way uh, so that you can remember this. And I promise you do not have to remember any equations or any math, uh, but uh, the principles are what matters. And I think I'll I have a way that they will stick for you. So first I want to talk a little bit about uh, these things, our brains. Um, and really uh, what our brains are are dichotomizing machines. And when I say that, what I mean is that what human brains, human cognition is really good at is taking in actually very complex and even multi-dimensional data and then processing it in such a way that you can then make a binary decision. You can take this huge mass of complex and sometimes contradictory data and sift it and sort it and prioritize it and ignore it and leave yourself with a yes, no decision or a uh, good, bad decision or a friend or foe decision or a pathogenic or benign decision. And this process of distilling down, organizing and um, prioritizing this very complex data is something our brains are intuitively really quite good at. And what, what we're trying to do with this process is to take that apart and understand what these uh, uh, kinds of data are and rationally process them and even derive mathematical models that can take those data and do this in a quantitative way. The problem is, is that nobody actually believes in probability. Um, normally, um, uh, I give this talk and you know, I fly around the country, sometimes around the world to do this, and there's um, somebody in the seat next to me on the airplane. And uh, what I've noticed uh, is that that person is either certain that they're going to arrive safely at the scheduled destination, or they're certain that they're going to die. Um, much more of the former than the latter, but occasionally you get sit, sat next to somebody who's just terrified of flying and just sure it's gonna turn out badly. Um, and, and that's a great example of the person next to me never says, says hi, it's nice to meet you. I realize we have a one in 8 million chance of dying today. They don't think that, they don't say that, that's not how their brains work. They're either sure they're gonna be okay or they're sure they're gonna die because we're dichotomizing machines. And so what all of us though have to do with this kind of complex information that we're faced with every day is take in that information, process it the best we can and then make the best decision you possibly can with the information that you have, even if it's not perfect information and even if it's not complete information. Okay, um, so that's kind of a fundamental concept, but now we wanna have a little more fun. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this. Um, this is called the Monty Hall problem, and it's based on a 1970s game show. I don't know, does anybody, um, do we have the window that allows me to see if anybody can give a thumbs up that they actually know this problem and know what the answer is? Jenny, can we see that? Um, I'm not sure. Maybe folks can, can type in the chat. Type in the chat. Maybe let me see. Let me see. Oh, yeah. Right. I see several folks heard it. Yep. Familiar oh, with good. it. Good, good, good. Yeah. Lots of people who are <laughs> on this. Okay, good. All right. So here's the rules for the game. Um, there's three doors. And behind one of those three doors is a great prize, like a new car or a, a fancy vacation. Behind the other two doors is a goat. Uh, and this was a show, mind you, in the 1970s where 
having someone give you a goat was a terrible thing. It's now it's kind of very hipster and fashionable to have a goat in the backyard, right? Uh, back then, you would pay someone to take a goat away from you. Um, so it was it was really a bad prize. Um, Monty Hall knows which of the three doors has the prize and which of the three doors has, uh, which two of the doors have the goat. And he brings up a contestant um, and that uh, asks that contestant to please pick one of the three doors. But the key thing is that contestant does not get to open the door. Monty then opens one of the other two doors all right, and so let's just say for simplicity, uh, Jenny, let's say you pick door number one. Uh, mm -hmm. Monty says, that's great. And he opens door number three and there's a goat. And then the next thing is Monty asks Jenny, that's my dog going crazy about the FedEx delivery guy. Sorry about that. Um, Monty asks Jenny, would you like to switch from door number one to door number two. Jenny, do you have a thought about that? Uh, I'm gonna say no. Mm. Okay, you're sticking with your original choice. Okay, all right, that's yeah. interesting. All right, all right, now, I'm, I'm gonna actually change problems. I want you to hold that problem in your mind. So we have three doors, you pick your door and then you get asked if you wanna change. Whether or not the change turns out to be mathematically a pretty tricky problem um, but we'll come back to it at the end what i want to start with actually is a little bit of a simpler problem where there's only two options uh, this is very similar to the uh, problem from the princess bride with Vizzini and wesley who's otherwise known as the man in black who has to pick one of the two goblets uh, and one of which is poisoned and he has to reason his way through doing that. Um, we're going to do that. I won't ask you to choose between a goblet uh, with poison and without. I'm going to ask you to pick amongst two bags uh, of M&Ms. Okay. And I have uh, with me today, I went to the store uh, Monday and I got my two bags and, uh, and I have two. And one of them has all green M&Ms, and the other one has half green and half blue. Okay, but the two bags are the same. You don't know which is which. And so I'm going to ask Jenny to pick one of the two bags. Jenny, which one would uh, you like? I'll say your left hand. Okay, you're the picking my left, left hand, yep. this one? Yep. Okay. And all right, so I can see in the bag, I'm like Monty, but you can't, Jenny. What is the likelihood that you picked the all green M&M bag? Uh, one and two. Okay, I think everybody would agree with that. And so we're gonna go with that. So the likelihood is now one and two. Now, let's say Jenny, you're a little bit peckish or hungry. <laughs> and you decide to reach in and get an M&M &M, and you pull it out. Yep. It's green. It is. All right. So now, Jenny, I'm going to ask you again. <laughs> What's the likelihood that you picked the all green M&M &M bag versus the one that's half green and half blue? Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, I'd like to say the same one and two, but uh, I'm wondering if it's higher now because you got a green and not a blue. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting point. <laughs> uh, and while we are pondering Jenny's um, puzzlement, I'm getting hungry, so I'm going to pull out another M&M. &M. Yep. So how, now how are you feeling so, about it, Jenny? <laughs> so I would say with every subsequent green M&M you pull out, the chances of this being the all green bag is higher. 
Okay, that's a really good intuition. Now, of course, if I were, if I was hungry and I had pulled out an all blue M&M, &M, we have a very, very different situation, right? Yes, absolutely. All of a sudden things have dramatically and non-probabilistically changed because then you're certain I have the half green, half blue bag. But we have incomplete information here, but we have some information. And Jenny's intuition is that we are starting to, it's starting to become a little more likely that this is the all green bag because of the behavior she has witnessed, which is green M&Ms. So just for yucks, let's see, let's try one more time. Okay, we got three. And it turns out Jenny's intuition is very perceptive and correct. Um, she probably doesn't know how to calculate the likelihood that that's the all green bag versus the half green, half blue, but her intuition is correct and she's moving probabilities in the right way. So Jenny had one belief when we started this process and then she started seeing evidence about those bags and that evidence started to shift her assessment of that original probability and change it from 0.5 to something that is greater than 0.5. Let's just not be quantitative about it and say that. And so it turns out that that is exactly what the Reverend Thomas Bayes said. What he actually said is written as this which is like you're looking at that and you're saying, oh boy, here he goes with equations. I'm, I hate this stuff. So let's just talk about it as in English. The Reverend's equation was this. And what this equation says, if you read it in English, is that the probability of A being true, if B is true, is equal to the probability that B is true if A is true, times the probability of A, all divided by the probability of B. And you're all kind of sitting there, probably scratching your heads, wondering what the heck that means. And you can think about it this way, and it's based on two things. It's based on this supposition. That the answer to your question is, what is the probability of A given that B is true? It turns out it's related to the probability that B is true if A is true. And a good example of that is stoplights. So if I have a red stoplight, uh, cars are typically stopped at that light. So I can ask you the question, how likely is it that the cars are stopped if the light is red? And then you could tell me that uh, I don't know, but I bet it's related to how likely the light is red if the cars are stopped. Those two probabilistic concepts are related to each other mathematically. And therefore, if you know one, you can understand the other. That is what's called inverse probability. And, and it's, it's a funny way to think about things, but it's the crux of this whole thing. And you can ask the question two ways. And you can ask it one way, which is the, the way we typically think about probability. Given a bag of equal numbers of blue and green M&Ms, what can be said about the likelihood of drawing a green M&M? And as Jenny did, uh, right off the top of her head. She's very comfortable with that problem. But then there's another way to ask a question, which is direct mathematically really the first question is, given that I draw a green M&M, what can be said about the mix of blue and green M&Ms in the bag? And that is the crux of inverse probability. This thing up here, this first bullet is the probability of A given B. This is the probability of B given A, okay? All right, and fundamentally what uh, the Reverend Bayes determined uh, is that 
probability in his frame is a measure of a degree of belief of an assertion. And so the theorem links the degree of belief in an assertion or a proposition before and after accounting for a piece of evidence. And if you actually take a step back and think about it, that is actually how all diagnosticians think. That is exactly what they do with every diagnostic test they order on every patient for every disease. If the patient has a likelihood of disease when they walk in the clinic, you order a test. The result of that test, positive or negative, raises or lowers the likelihood that the patient has that disease. That is using Bayesian reasoning and Bayesian interpretation. Now, what it is not is this other kind of statistics that we're all much more familiar with. Uh, that's called frequentist or sometimes name and Pearson statistics. And that's what we do when we do power analyses and we calculate p-values in our papers, etc. It's valid, it's useful, it's an essential part of good science if it's done properly. But it is completely different from Bayesian probability and Bayesian statistics. And you have to understand what the two kinds of uh, probability are used for and how to use them correctly in the right scenario. Okay, here's another classic problem <clears throat> that all clinical geneticists should know how to handle. And it's based on a simple clinical question, which is a lady comes in and wants to know if she's a carrier for an X-linked disease. She happens to know that her mother is a carrier for an X-linked disease. X-linked diseases, for those of you who aren't uh, intimately familiar with them, uh, are based on an inheritance pattern where, because women have two X chromosomes and men have one, uh, the, uh, the behavior of the disease in the sexes is a bit different. Women have two chromosomes, so they can have two wild type, the pluses mean uh, normal uh, alleles. And if you have two normal alleles, normal. A woman who has one mutation allele and one normal allele is a carrier or a heterozygote. And a woman with two uh, mutant chromosomes is affected with that disease, which is usually in this inheritance pattern extremely rare uh, because uh, males uh, uh, generally don't transmit the mutation allele to their daughters. But men only have one X chromosome, so if they have a, uh, the plus, the wild type, the normal, if they have the mutation, they are affected. All right, so uh, Jenny, can I uh, annoy you again? Uh, given that this lady's mom has two X chromosomes and one's a mutation uh, allele and one's wild type, what's the likelihood that this lady is a carrier? Uh, one in two. She's going with 0.5 again, okay. All right, so that's great. So she uh, is very grateful for your advice, Jenny, and she goes off and has some kids and comes back a number of years later and says, hey, Jenny, um, you know, I had this great clinic visit with you four or five years ago, and you told me that it was a 50% likelihood that I'm a carrier. Um, and, but my doctor said I should come back and talk to you again because I've now gone and had three unaffected boys and I wanna know what is my likelihood of being a carrier now? And what would your answer be, Jenny? You don't have um, to give it a number. Yeah, I'm glad I don't have to give a number. That would be delving into my dim and distant past and be, you know. <laughs> But um, if she had three unaffected boys, her chance of being a carrier will be less. Her prior probability was one in two, but the fact she's had these three unaffected children will reduce her chances of being a carrier. Great. All right. So how did Jenny do that? So the way that this is actually done requires, again, this thinking about inverse probability, which is a weird thing to do. And it's somewhat, I like to use uh, this because it reminds me that you can think of the simultaneous existence of two different realities. You can think about this as two alternative realities. And let's go to 
alternative reality one. So let's imagine a universe where this lady is a carrier. And you can ask the question, what's the likelihood of this reality given that she is a carrier? And so as Jenny said, her prior probability of being a carrier was one half. Her conditional probability, which is a new term I'm introducing to you, is the chance of her having three unaffected boys if she is a carrier. That's that inverse probability question. It's asking the question, if she were a carrier, how likely is it that this would have happened to her? And you say, huh, that's interesting. Um, if she is a carrier, the likelihood of each boy being unaffected is a half. So the likelihood of having three boys unaffected is a half times a half times a half. And if her prior probability of being a carrier was a half, and her likelihood of having three unaffected boys is an eighth, that means the probability that both of those things are true is one half times one eighth, which means one out of 16 in that alternative reality universe. Okay. Now let's look at alternative reality or alternative universe number two. What is the likelihood that she, or what is the likelihood of this pedigree if she's not a carrier? So Jenny said she, her prior probability was one half. And then you ask the question, what's her likelihood of having three unaffected boys if she's not the carrier? And that likelihood is essentially one obviously. And so the likelihood that both those things are true is a half because it's one half times one. Now you ask yourself, okay, there's two alternative universes. Which alternative universe is more or less likely than the other? And that's actually pretty easy to do with some little very simple algebra. You just take the likelihood of universe one and divide it by the likelihood of universe one plus the likelihood of universe two. If you want to understand the likelihood of universe two, it's the likelihood of universe two over universe one plus universe two. So one sixteenth over one sixteenth plus one half is one ninth. And one half over one sixteenth plus one half is eight ninths. <clears throat> so Jenny's instinct that it's decreased is mathematically proven to be the case. It's gone from one half to one out of nine because of the evidence that has accumulated related to her being a carrier or not, because it's more likely she's not a carrier if she's having multiple unaffected boys. And what you might notice is that this problem is exactly the same as this problem. All right, so Jenny now knows that the likelihood that this bag that she picked is the mixed bag has gone down from one half to one ninth, and it's actually eight ninths likelihood that this is the all green bag, which is actually a pretty big drop when you stop to think about it. All right, okay. So the Reverend Bayes would say that Jenny's degree of belief in that proposition, what the likelihood was that this was the mixed versus the all green bag, the likelihood that it was the mixed bag declined after she accounted for the evidence that she observed, which is the three green M&Ms. Okay, so that's the Reverend and his law. Now let's switch over to your business, which is variant classification. So what this is all based on, of course, is the ACMG interpretation, uh, which is, we call Richards et al. And what they did is what is called in science a heuristic, which is basically a, uh, a tool or a rubric or a workaround that is useful and uh, practical even if it isn't perfectly correct or true or complete. And that's called a heuristic, a good enough 
And what Richards et al. did is they took the various kinds of evidence that uh, clinical labs use in thinking about variant pathogenicity and broke them into categories. Then they used their judgment to relatively weight the evidence and decide that some kinds of evidence were stronger than other kinds of evidence. And then they combined that evidence by certain rules into a pseudo quantitative likelihood output. Their uh, evidence rules are here. So I'm sure you're all uh, familiar with those. A number of different types or categories ranging from supporting moderate and strong to very strong. And then these are the uh, combining rules that Richards et al. used, um, uh, which uh, give you a number of kinds of combinations of evidence that can give you the five different outputs. And the output is based on an adaptation of a scale developed by the International Association for Research on Cancer. Uh, which broke it into five categories, which is, uh, and you can think of as the posterior probability of Bayes, right? This is a, a probability uh, of pathogenicity after taking the evidence into account. This is pseudo quantitative because there's, you know, no real measured uh, uh, data that were used in the Richards et al. system. So it's pseudo quantitative. This scale is not linear. Uh, the category, uh, five categories are, are of un unequal size. And it's always good to remind people that benign is not the inverse of pathogenetic. Pathogenic, pathogenic is 99% or 99 to one. Benign is one in a thousand, which is 999 to one against. So it's smaller than pathogenic. And of course, this great big middle thing is variant of uncertain significance, which is 10% to 90%. And this harkens back to how I started, uh, which is that human brains are dichotomizing machines. We kind of don't like intermediate or indeterminate answers to questions. We like yeses and nos. Uh, a great um, anecdote about this is uh, from Nate Cohen's book, um, of the signal and the noise um, and it is about the National Weather Service and it relates a story where um, they gave out, no I'm sorry it's about the Weather Channel not the National Weather Service but the Weather Channel a, a commercial company um, when they made predictions of 50 percent chance of rain they had reduced uh, evaluations of uh, viewers satisfaction with the weather forecast which makes sense because human beings find it hard to make decisions when the probability is 50 percent they don't know whether they should go on a picnic or they should go to the movie theater they don't like it they rather have a piece of evidence that leans one way or another and make a decision uh, because they can't make decisions when the probabilities are equal. So the Weather Channel's solution to this was, oddly enough, they randomly changed it to either 40% or 60% chance of precipitation. And whether they're right or wrong is less important than the fact that they gave people actually an answer and they were happier with that. Because again, our brains are dichotomizing machines. Now, a group of us actually, in looking at the Richards et al. rules, realized that uh, in variant interpretation, you can think about it the same way. We have a degree of belief in the pathogenicity of a variant before we have any evidence. For example, we really don't know enough to call it pathogenic if we don't know anything about it. But then uh, we develop evidence or we uh, identify evidence and we start to change our assessment of the pathogenicity. That's Bayesian thinking. So a variant can be assigned a prior probability of pathogenicity complicated. We could have a whole separate discussion on what that prior probability should be. It was set somewhat arbitrarily uh, for this purpose. Uh, the key thing is that to make this work, it really shouldn't be dependent on whether or not the patient is um, uh, known to be affected with the disorder. That has an actually interesting effect, and we can talk about that if you want later. We then modify that prior probability with conditional probabilities, 
think like population frequency, the bioinformatics score, functional data, whatever. And we use math to get a posterior probability in a quantitative sense from that. And again, this is exactly the same as what Jenny did with the M&Ms. So our assumptions are that each of the different um, types of evidence in Richards et al. are independent, which means that mathematically we can use a, the math that's called naive Bayesian classifiers, uh, which we don't need to get into the details of the other Bayesian classifiers. Uh, this is the simple one. We excluded that criterion BA1, which is the so-called standalone frequency criterion, because it's a rule out criterion. And if you meet BA1, the variant is benign no matter what else is true, which is problematic on some levels, but practically useful. Um, the evidence levels we recognize could be treated as exponential probabilities. And I'll show you about that in a minute. And then we set the prior at point one, and I'll show you how we did that. Turns out that when you look at the Richards et al. rules in general, two supportings is equal to a moderate, two moderates is equal to a strong, and two strongs is equal to a very strong. That's the way they set up their combining rules, which means you can derive this formula, which means that all the probabilities are based on one of the probabilities, and you can just use them as exponents and add the, the pieces of evidence together, weighted one, two, four, or eight for their strength, and you get the total evidence strength. And then you do the calculation, uh, which no one needs to remember this formula. We have spreadsheets that calculate this for you of what is the posterior probability once you have this uh, aggregate odds of pathogenicity for the four levels of evidence. That's odds path, and you have the prior probability you do a simple calculation and it tells you what the posterior probability is, the pathogenicity for that variant. Now, what you would like to see is that it uh, gives outputs like this, such that pathogenic, again, this is based on that IARC scale. You want pathogenic to be greater than 99%. You want likely to be 90 to 99, the US 10 to 90 likely benign 0.1 to 1 and benign less than 0.1. Uh, a calculation was done using several formulas, not interesting to determine that the prior probability should be 0 0.1 and the odds of pathogenicity of a very strong variant should be 350 to 1 odds. And then you can ask the question, okay, if I have transformed this Bayes heuristic rule set now into an equation, how well does it match the output of the Richards et al. system? So the rich, here's Richards et al. combining rule number one, which is one very strong piece of evidence and one strong piece of evidence is pathogenic. So here's the formula. So 350 to, one, 350 to the exponent of here's one very strong and one strong all right, so that would be 350 to the power of 1.5, use the prior probability of 0.1, and this, um, this equation becomes 6,558, and the posterior is actually 0.999. It's actually higher than you even need for pathogenic, so that's cool. You can do that for all of the Richards et al. criteria. And it turns out it works quite nicely with two exceptions. Uh, pathogenic rule two is actually 0.975. It doesn't actually meet the pathogenic uh, weight. And pat likely pathogenic rule one is stronger than the other likely pathogenic rules and should really be considered pathogenic. So there's some internal inconsistency with the uh, Richards et al. Uh, system. Now then the neat thing about this is that um, in Richards et al, I, oh, I can't remember if I, oh, I didn't put that slide in. Uh, you might remember from that uh, combining slide I had. In Richards et al, if you have conflicting evidence, it's always a VUS. And you know, I can see why they did that. Uh, it was practical, uh, but it didn't feel right to a lot of us and it, and it isn't right. 
And why it doesn't feel right is if you have a ton of evidence for pathogenicity and a little teeny bit of evidence that it's benign, it's not a VUS, it's either pathogenic or likely pathogenic. Turns out with this mathematical system, you can take your pathogenic rules, your four pathogenic levels here, which you add these together, and you can take the benign ones and then subtract them and recalculate so you can combine benign with pathogenic evidence and determine the relative weighting of those two kinds of evidence and show that, for example, if you have pathogenic rule 1B, which is um, too moderate uh, pathogenic and a PVS1, a very strong, so one very strong and two moderate pathogenic, and then you add just one supporting benign piece of evidence to that, you run the calculation, it comes out as 0.997. It's actually still pathogenic. In, in contrast, if you have two strong pathogenics <clears throat> and one strong benign, you're still leaning towards pathogenic, but you do the calculation, it's 0.675, it's the US. Okay, so the attributes of this, uh, of the Richards et al. system is that it is inherently Bayesian decision making. It's a heuristic, but what they, actually created, and, and we've talked to the people who were in that committee, they had absolutely no conscious realization that that is what they were doing. They just did it intuitively, and it turns out it's very consistent with a Bayesian mathematical model. Again, showing you how clinical reasoning is inherently Bayesian because this very talented group of laboratory uh, geneticists just did that intuitively. But we can transform it from an intuitive system into a formalized quantitative system and actually make the calculations. And this allows us to um, do the um, pathogenicity assessments in a more objective way, as well as we can then start to think about actually coupling the system to real data. That is, we can begin to look for in, in science for evidence that allows us to make these calculations that are based on real world data. And then, then our probabilities can be updated and recalculated as we learn more and develop better data. Now, another thing I just wanna talk about briefly um, is, and it's something that a lot of people are confused about, um, the difference between the pathogenicity of the variant and the likelihood that the person who's being tested has the disease. It turns out that these two numbers do not represent the same thing, okay? The probability of pathogenicity, which is what um, labs calculate based on the evidence for that variant, does not mean, let's say if it's pathogenic, does not mean that there's a 99% chance that the person has this disease. And that may puzzle a few of you when you first hear it, but it actually makes sense. And this is because, um, in fact, this is probabilistic, right? A lot of people have the misconception that medical tests are determinative, that if the test is abnormal, you have the disease and the test is normal, you don't. But that's not how it works. In fact, nearly all tests are probabilistic and I'll give you an example of the same test that gives two very different likelihoods of diseases uh, from a genetic test. And it's all about the context. So in scenario one, a young man presents for a checkup and the doc notes that he has some facial and skeletal features of Marfan syndrome, even though he doesn't have a family history of Marfan syndrome. He has an uh, aortic root size, which is uh, at the upper limit of normal, which is something that we see in Marfan syndrome. And that doc says, gee, you know, I think this guy is pretty likely to have Marfan syndrome. Let's say that's about, I think that's about 75% likely. So the doc orders a, a test on him and an exome and returns a pathogenic variant in FBN1, fibrofibrillin 1, the gene known to be associated with Marfan syndrome. And I went to uh, Hal Dietz, an expert in Marfan syndrome at Johns Hopkins, and got these numbers. And Hal and I estimate that in patients with known Marfan syndrome, a pathogenic variant is identified about 70% of the time. And in people without Marfan syndrome, if you just sequence a bunch of people who are healthy, 
you will get a false positive result of a variant in fibrillin 1 said to be pathogenic uh, in about one in a thousand people. And that's again because our variant pathogenicity assessments are not perfect. Sometimes we call variants pathogenic when they're not. And so what's the likelihood that the patient has Marfan syndrome? I won't ask you to do the math, but it turns out it's about 99.8%, which as far as clinicians are concerned, that is above the, the threshold of practical clinical certainty. And we would say this young man has Marfan syndrome. Okay, so that's straightforward. That's a diagnostic testing setting. And again, remember that the pathogenicity of the variant, which is above 0.99, because we call it pathogenic, is not necessarily this number, okay? And you'll see that in a second. Now, let's change the context. So a pediatrician orders an exome on a toddler because that toddler has, a uh, young child has autism. No variant for the autism is identified, but he has a secondary finding of a pathogenic variant in fibrillin 1. The toddler has no apparent features in Marfan syndrome, and she's adopted, so we don't have any family history to know whether her family members have Marfan syndrome or not. And as part of her autism uh, workup, she had been to a geneticist and had an echocardiogram and an eye exam. Both of them were normal. So what's the likelihood that she has Marfan syndrome? Remember, this is a pathogenic variant. Pathogenic means there's, it's at least 99% likely to be pathogenic for that disease. Turns out it's 8%. And that may really surprise some people, but this is always going to be the case in diagnostic testing versus screening, that the test actually has a different, yields a different answer in those two contexts. And why are those two contexts so different? Another way to look at it, is that in scenario one, there was a 75% likelihood that the patient had the test, had the disease. And so the behavior of that variant, which is 99% likely to be pathogenic, is going to be yielding mostly true positives and a few false positives. But in scenario two, when we're taking people who are apparently or otherwise healthy from the general population, not very many of those people have Marfan syndrome. The prevalence of Marfan syndrome in, that, in the general population is about one in 7,500. Then if you look at the false positive rate, it turns out you generate many more false positives than you do true positives. So that means it's not very likely that that toddler has Marfan syndrome, but it's still 8%, which means you got to pay attention to it. You got to think about it but it's very, very different. Okay, so back to Monty Hall. All right, so uh, Jenny, are you with me? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> push on you again here. All right, so okay. before any of the doors were open, Jenny, what was the likelihood that the prize was behind door number one? One in three. Okay. Everybody, I hope, would agree with that. Now I'm going to ask a weird question. All right, that's one in three. All right, before any of the doors were open, what was the chance the prize was behind either door two or door three? Which is the same as saying, what's the likelihood that it wasn't behind door number one, Jenny? Uh, okay, let me think of it. <laughs> so the likelihood it's not a two and three. Two, two and three. three. I agree with you. Okay. All right. So the, if you had picked door number one, um, the likelihood you were right was one in three, and the likelihood that uh, you were wrong is two out of three. Mm -hmm. Now, Monty did this. He opened door number three. And the likelihoods of it being door one or not being door one do not change. Mm -hmm. but the likelihood of it being door number three is now zero, right? right? So what's the likelihood it's behind door number two? Uh, so two and three. All right. And if you 
if you don't like this answer, you're in good company. It turns out this um, <laughs> was in, um, uh, this was a column. They had a puzzle column and um, there's a U.S. newspaper insert called Parade Magazine, the junkie insert, but they used to have a, a puzzle column and this was in the puzzle column. And it generated, it generated more letters to the editor than any puzzle ever and befuddled so many people. It was fascinating, including some really good mathematicians. All right. Because, all right, let's look at it a different way. <clears throat> Remember, it feels like, ooh, that, that just doesn't feel right. But think about it this way. All right. There are only three possibilities, right? The, the prize is either behind door three, door two, or door one. Jenny picked door number one. And if she stays with her choice of door number one, and then of these three possibilities, in one out of the three, she will win the prize. If she switches, she wins two out of three times. Why is that? It's because when Monty Hall opens door number three, he's telling you something that you may not realize it, but he's telling you something, which is that he can't open the door that has the prize behind it. So there's a chance that if the if we are in either of these two scenarios, if it's either door two or door three, Monty has to open the other door. So in those scenarios, what he's doing is telling you in two out of three scenarios where the car is, okay? Because otherwise he would reveal it, which would spoil the game. Now, that probably didn't convince all of you. So here's a, what's called a decision tree algorithm that says there's a one third chance that the car is behind door one, one third is behind door two, and one third is behind door three. If it's behind door number one, the host half the time will open door number two and half the time they'll open door number three, right? Because if it's behind door one, he can open either door. So the total probability of that's one sixth and the total probability of that is one sixth because it's one third times one half is one sixth, one third times one half is one sixth. And if the car is behind door two, then Monty has to open door number three. He's forced to open door number three. So that's one third times one is a third. And if it's behind door three, he has to open door two. So this tree shows you every possible outcome if given the Jenny pick door number one. Then if you look at, if she stays, she gets the car in these right? Because it is behind door number one. And if she switches, she gets the prize if in these scenarios. These two scenarios add up to two-thirds. These two scenarios add up to one-third. Okay. And even if you don't like that, you can do it. look at it this way, which is that you can ask a computer to randomly place the prize and, and have it pick one of the doors and run it thousands and thousands of times. And what you will see is that the likelihood <clears throat> of winning if you change is twice as high as the likelihood of you win if you stay with the door you originally picked. Because again, this is a Bayesian problem and Monty Hall's behavior of opening a door is a piece of evidence, not certain, but it's a clue, it's a piece of evidence about which door it has the prize. So you have to always understand that genomic testing, even though a lot of us to treat it, treat it as you know this genetic determinism or genetic fate or whatever you want to call it, it's not true. And your genes will not always tell you what will happen, and that's fortunate or un, depends on how you look at it. But there's many things that lie between the presence of a variant and the manifestation of the phenotype. And, and genetic testing is not fate, it is probabilistic, but it's incredibly useful if you know how to use it. Another way to say this though, is that genetics is not exceptional. It's the same as every other test we use in clinical medicine. Just because you have a low hemoglobin doesn't mean you have anemia. <laughs>
All right. So that's a little bit of math. Hopefully it wasn't uh, too much for you. You don't have to, re again, remember any of the equations. All you have to remember is Jenny picking those green M&Ms out of that bag. And that is fundamentally, that's how Bayesian probability works. And that's fundamentally what we're doing when we classify variants and we use evidence to assess the pathogenicity. So I'll stop there. Um, if any of you are the slightest bit intrigued by anything about uh, Bayes' Law, I would highly recommend you order this book. It's a wonderful read. Uh, Wendy Rubenstein, uh, now at the FDA, a genetics colleague of mine, pointed this out to me called The Theory That Would Not Die. And it's actually a wonderful, really engaging and short book with no equations in it. And it's just stories of how Bayes' rule was used um, uh, to do things like um, crack the Enigma code, which is the story behind, um, if any of you saw the movie, The Imitation Game, about Alan Turing and the German codes in World War II. It's actually what uh, Turing did was, in fact, uh, a, use a Bayesian approach to code cracking. And it wasn't really the machine that fundamentally did that. It was his application of Bayes' rule that allowed him to crack the code. Uh, they use it for uh, hunting submarines, algorithms for uh, figuring out the location of submarines uh, in uh, warfare um, and other applications. And they're just a series of great stories and you'll really enjoy it and have a better appreciation uh, for Bayes' rule. So I'll stop there uh, and thank you all for paying attention and I would be happy to take any questions and I can stay after uh, one if people want to, to ask questions. So thanks very much. That was fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. Biesiger. And uh, yeah, I love the m and example. <laughs> that was really great. And certainly there were a lot of comments about that uh, in the chat as well. This really helpful way of, um, in fact, I see a comment here, the most engaging talk on Bayes I've seen. Thank you so much. Oh, thanks. So, um, a lot of really great comments. Um, so does anybody have um, additional questions for Dr. Biesiger? I've seen other comments, applause, agree, uh, very interesting, <laughs> so lots of great feedback. Yeah, it's too bad we didn't get to do this in person because then I, you know, in the in-person meeting, I would actually be giving out M&Ms for you all to snack That'd on. Great. I know. We can't do Lunch that. Lunchtime too. <laughs> yeah. um, so here's a question. Um, when will ACMG update to a more numerical system? Great question. Uh, so uh, I'm actually along with uh, Stephen Harrison, who is my <coughs> co-chair on the ClinGen Sequence Variant Interpretation Committee. Uh, Stephen and I have been appointed the co-chairs of the ACMG AMP ClinGen ISB Committee. Uh, which is a mouthful, but is, you can actually think of it as Richard's 2.0. Uh, and so we are charged with um, doing the next version of the Richards et al. paper. And what we will do is incorporate um, these concepts into the next uh, round of that so that we can, again, be more quantitative, uh, better calculate the US's, et cetera. The other thing that we are, I can tell you, sort of tentatively working on is, you know, the Bayes thing is, is great and I can, anybody who wants it, just write me and I can send you the Excel sheet that allows you to do the calculations. Um, but it is a bit cumbersome. And uh, what uh, we have come to realize, and there's a, a paper, uh, unofficial paper in press, uh, where what we have shown uh, is um, that you can convert it into a point system. You can give one, two, four, and eight points to supporting benign, supporting moderate, uh, strong, and very strong, uh, and just add those one, two, four, eights together and then compare it to some point thresholds and it works equally well. Oh, well, we've got some great questions here. Uh, the Praha, Zhao, that is a great question. He, uh, she or she says the prior of 10% seems high if testing in the general population. That is a very insightful observation and is exactly correct. And um, I see you're going to hear uh, later in the summer from Helen Firth. Helen and I have been working on this problem. And it's absolutely correct because 
uh, if you do a genome sequence, especially on a, a person from the general population, is the prior probability of pathogenicity for every variant in that person's genome 10 percent? No way is it 10 percent. It's much, much lower than that. And so um, what we realize is the prior actually of Richards et al. And it makes sense. It, it, it includes an implicit assumption that you're doing a single gene test of a person with a disease, because that's what most clinical genetic testing has been done, has been uh, used for in the past. And in fact, that what we know is now, of course, we're doing secondary findings, right? And so if we're doing secondary findings, that's very different. That's screening versus diagnosis. And so those priors are not the same. And we need a prior that better reflects that and takes that into account. And so you're absolutely correct. 10% is not going to be generally useful. And we're going to have to fix that. Let's see. Someone asked for the calculator. And yeah, just pop me an email. I'll um, uh, type my email in here so everyone can have it um, and just pop me an email and I will send you the uh, Excel spreadsheet and you can uh, calculate to your heart's content. Uh, let's see, another question. Oh yeah, Jessica did a note that it is in the supplement to the Tatigan and all paper, so you can get it there. Uh, Emily asked, how does the Bayesian approach perform across different genes? That's a great question. Um, we don't know that, but it, it has to perform essentially as well as does Richards at all across different genes. And as I'm sure you all know, the variant panels, variant curation expert panels are working on refining the rules so they work better with specific genes because the Richards et al. approach is a generic or agnostic approach. And we know that all those criteria don't work as well for every gene. And so that's something we have to work on. Uh, let's see. Ah, Anjana asked about penetrance. We are not talking about penetrance. That is yet another calculation, which it, this is interesting. You, there's three numbers then. There's the pathogenicity of the variant. There's the likelihood that the patient has the disease. And there's the likelihood that the patient will have a recognizable manifestation of the disease. The third thing is penetrance. Those are all three different probabilistic uh, assessments. And you have to think about them separately. Uh, let's see. Dimitri says, uh, well, let's see, yeah, Dimitri, uh, supporting evidence criteria are not equal. Yeah, that is absolutely correct. Um, and the Richards et al. was constrained to four levels of evidence from the a very, very practical reason uh, that they, number one, didn't have enough information to sift them into finer, more than four categories, as well as their combining criteria would become a nightmare, really. I mean, that combining criteria table would have been gigantic if they, for example, had 10 different levels of evidence. It would have been a mess. With the Bayes, you can have as many criteria as you want. And in fact, you don't even need to have discrete levels. You can actually just use, well, this is theoretical, but you can actually theoretically use the actual conditional probability. That is, and this is something we're also working on. We can take a gene, uh, my variant curation expert panel is working on RYR1, and we can actually derive the conditional probabilities for SIFT or polyphen or uh, Ravel and show what that is for a truth set of variants and then use that actual um, uh, conditional probability in a calculation numerically instead of categorically. So that could actually be done. That's probably a ways down the road uh, but it uh, is feasible. So Dimitri also says here, um, Bayes' approach is valuable, but heavily depends on the quality of the priors. 
It does. It, and I think that is a fair assertion. And there is actually a way to get to a really, really robust prior, which is what uh, I call, and this is what I'm working on with Helen Firth, a genomic prior, which is you know how many variants are in the genome, the average person, and you can estimate, although we really don't know this, but you can estimate to within an order of magnitude how many Mendelian disease associated variants an average person has. And based on that, you can calculate what's called a genomic prior. And that is a very robust number. And if you start with that as your prior and work up from there, then you're on much more solid ground than the Richards et al. 0.1. And again, you know, if you just look at Richards et al. and ignore the whole Bayesian, Tavtegan et al. paper, it literally means, and this was Helen Firth's concern that she brought to me, uh, the Richards et al. paper literally applied means that every variant in your genome is at the boundary of VUS and likely benign until proven otherwise. And that is just intuitively wrong. It's way, way, way too high. So again, um, we have to work back to a, um, a, a more robust prior. Let's see. Uh, somebody, uh, Christine, thoughts on providing genetic incidental cellular findings to patients in diagnostic testing settings. I, I have a ton of thoughts about that, Christine. Um, we do it all the time, and we're actually making good progress on doing this. I don't know, Christine, if you want to write, there, there's a, a dozen considerations uh, uh, that I could uh, bring to your question if you want to follow up and write one of the more specific ones about which consideration you're specifically asking about. We do it all the time uh, and it goes in essentially all cases uh, and it goes well. Do you feel like what we're currently doing is a good set of, I mean, in returning, why don't you unmute, Christine? Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. 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 Thank you. Um, this was such a great talk. Yeah, I was just curious um, if you feel like what we're currently doing um, as a field in terms of returning secondary findings is, um, you know, sufficient given the current state of affairs, or if you think there's um, substantial room for improvement. Well, there's, a, there's, oh, there's much room for improvement. The ACMG 59 gene list, which I co-created so I can be critical of it, um, is for certain wrong. There are some genes on there that I am not, I'm, I'm pretty sure we shouldn't be returning variants on. And I'm pretty sure there are other genes and diseases um, that we should be returning uh, secondary findings on. And so that list itself is imperfect and needs to evolve. We have to think really carefully, and this is super hard because again, you know, people just don't like probability. Um, and we have to decide, you know, what do we want to do? Do we want to generate secondary findings results where a child has an 8% risk of having Marfan syndrome? And, you know, you can look at that and you'll get really different answers on that question. Now, I look at that and I say, that child is more than 100 hundred times more likely than the average child to have Marfan syndrome because of 8% versus one in 8,000. That's a huge increase in risk, but 92% of kids in whom I have such a finding will turn out not to have Marfan syndrome. So is that a, a good situation or a bad situation? And I think what we're finding, and, and the evidence is accumulating rapidly, is that individuals and families are actually much more accepting of this information than a lot of people thought they would be. They're willing to have that information. They can adapt the uncertainty associated with it, and they're willing to have surveillance and follow-up for these kinds of things in order to avert what could be a, a medical catastrophe. 
And I think we're moving towards uh, that way of thinking about it. And, and frankly, I think it is the future for our field is that we will shift from a primarily diagnostic modality to primarily a screening modality for finding genetic disease. It just really isn't acceptable that most people who, for example, have cancer susceptibility variants, most of those people are diagnosed after they get cancer. It's not acceptable. And we're used to it, and so we put up with it, and we wring our hands about the adverse consequences of overdiagnosis, but we're perfectly comfortable having people uh, come down with cancer when they didn't have to. Uh, and we have to change that. So I think we're going to shift our thinking about that, but it'll take quite a bit more data. So Ju Walk asks, has Bayesian approach been applied to the ACMG CMB heuristic? That's a great question. Uh, that's a, a little bit of a, a difficult issue. The CMB uh, point scale heuristic, interestingly, doesn't fit into a Bayesian framework. Mathematically, it, it can't fit uh, due to some attributes they built into it. So, um, and they did not claim in any way, shape, or form to be uh, developing a heuristic that was compatible with Bayes. Um, and we've communicated with them uh, after the uh, publication of that. And so we'll have to work together. Uh, they will have to be unified because as you folks well know, there are patients out there who have, for example, uh, diseases that are inherited in an autosomal recessive pattern. Uh, and uh, one of their alleles is a point variant and the other allele is a CNB. So in order to understand that person's genotype, the two systems have to be mathematically the same. Otherwise you just can't make sense out of uh, that genotype. And so uh, they will be unified in future editions. Uh, let's see, Andy asks, is it possible? Ah, great question. Okay, uh, Andy's asking if, if we really know if these criteria are properly weighted. It's a very insightful question. And you picked a great example, Andy, in PM2, which is absent in NOMAD. So the bad news is, uh, is that PM2 probably needs to go away. Uh, because um, we have evaluated it in several diseases that are very well known, several of the hereditary cancers. Um, and I can just uh, give you a, an ex example of how problematic this is. So uh, a supporting piece of evidence is a conditional probability of just over two to one odds. A moderate piece of evidence is a conditional probability of 4.5 to one odds, which means that you're four and a half times more likely to see that attribute if the variant is indeed pathogenic. That's what moderate means. Uh, strong is 18.7 to one, and very strong is 350 to one odds. So PM2 is moderate. That means it should be uh, 4.3 to one or greater odds. We've actually measured it in several diseases. And the, the actual conditional probability of PM2 is about 1.05 to one odds, which means it's way below supporting. One to one odds is no evidence whatsoever. So it is just a hair above nothing, not even close to supporting, at least for, for hereditary cancer uh, genes. Um, so I think that PM2 is grossly overweighted. Uh, we are counseling VSEPs to be careful with PM2. This hasn't been published yet, but we, we, we know it's coming sooner or later. So we're asking VSEPs when they are reviewed by SVI to consider at least downgrading PM2 to supporting so that they are not using moderate, at least get it down to uh, supporting. Um, or consider not using it. And for example, we actually did the analysis in our RYR1 VSEP. It is actually no evidence uh, in RYR1, so we just dropped it. Um, 
But as Heidi Rehm points out, we have to be very careful. It's, it's easy to um, uh, critically evaluate uh, criteria and knock them down, but we can't knock down too many criteria because if we knock down too many, a lot of variants are gonna fall. And it, what it means is that we're underweighting some evidence and overweighting others. And we can't just reduce pieces of evidence without strengthening others. Xiaodong Wang asked, how about PS2? Is it overweighted as well? Um, can somebody remind me? I, I'm so embarrassed. I cannot remember all these damn codes. What's PS2? It's the proven de novo one. Oh, de novo. I uh, haven't measured that yet. Uh, it may be actually underweighted. Um, a de novo that matches, because you know, it's not just that it's de novo, right? It's that it matches the phenotype. When you have a, uh, the slightest specificity of a phenotype, that is something other than, let's say, like um, intellectual disability or autism, if you have the slightest uh, specificity, uh, it is probably much stronger than PS1. Um, and so I think that's one that will go up when we have good evidence for it. It may not go up though, again, for things like autism and ID, because there are hundreds of genes that can cause that. So just because you have a de novo, and, and remember, you know, the average individual has uh, just over one de novo in an open reading frame. Uh, every generation. Uh, so uh, that de novo, you know, is not uh, by itself uh, enough to make it causative because um, we all have them. Um, so we have to be careful about that. PM2, how about very rare genetic disorders? Uh, Gabriella, maybe you can unmute. I don't completely understand your question. Or we have to... um, so... I don't know if you can hear me. Yes. I could hear you for a second there, Gabriella, but then you went quiet. How about now? Yes. I have an echo, sorry. You mentioned it's for cancer, but how about for rare genetic condition? Is PM2 really not useful at all? It's probably going to be uh, less useful the rarer the disorder is, right? Because the rarer it is, the less frequent it should be uh, in nomad as well or in the general population. So. Um, you would need more. You would need Nomad to be bigger to be equally confident about absence and Nomad being significant, right? So I think that cancer is probably the best case scenario, and that it and the fact that it doesn't work for cancer is very worrisome because you know BRCA one and two is I think, what is the estimate, the aggregate uh, population-wide estimate? Uh, I think it's like one in 250 individuals, something like that. And so you take that versus something like, um, I don't know, um, Kabuki syndrome. Um, it's gonna be hard to prove in Kabuki. So I think it's just not gonna work. And, um, there's one other question here, Dr. Biesker. Um, any planned applications on using a Bayes approach for upgrading or downgrading current evidence, uh, for example, for PM5? That's from Diane. Uh, can someone remind me PM5? Yeah, so that's the uh, missense change at the same amino acid, but to a different amino acid for, ah. you know, that's previously been described as pathogen. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Um, and that's one that's uh, quite, uh, readily calculatable. And so we should be able to gather um, a good data set on, on that, especially because you, you can look in NOMAD, you can ask how often those other variants appear in NOMAD and versus how often they appear uh, as uh, other pathogenic variants in mutation databases like ClinVar um, and measure that. 
uh, and we can calibrate it correctly. Um, it may depend on the, uh, the particular gene. And the other rule that uh, we have appended to PM5, and I think this will come out in the revision of Richards et al. as well, is um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with uh, a concept called a Grantham score. A Grantham score is a, uh, a metric of the similarity, just the chemical similarity of the uh, amino acid side chains. And for example, leucine and isoleucine are very similar chemically, right? Glycine and proline are extraordinarily different chemically. That, that, that side chain is just as different as they could be. And so what we have uh, amended that rule to say is that you can count it as moderate so long as the difference of the observed uh, Grantham score from the wild type is as great or greater than is the distance uh, in the known previously described pathogenic variant. So for example, if you, if the previous change, uh, pathogenic change was a leucine to isoleucine change, and mine that I'm now seeing in my sample I'm evaluating today is a leucine to proline change, that my leucine to proline is going to be a huge Grantham difference, and the previous leucine to isoleucine is a very small one. So my variant is looking biochemically worse than is the previous one, I would score PM5. If the converse was true, that is if the previously recognized pathogenic variant was leucine to proline, and my sample that I'm looking at today is leucine to isoleucine, I should be really careful about PM5, right? Because the previous case, it was a huge change in the amino acid caused the disease. I'm not as confident that a subtle change in that same codon is as likely to cause disease as was that really severe change. So I think we're gonna to need to have some more sophisticated thinking about PM5. Great, yeah, that was a, that's, um, yeah, a good way of looking at it. Um, so we still have some more questions. Are, are you still able to stay on the call? Is that okay? I am. And my colleague, Dr. Johnston, looks like she would like to amend my comments on PM2. <laughs> would you like to chime in, Jennifer? I don't know if amend. I would just clarify. Um, I, I just think that when people think about PM2, they think about the fact that something in Nomad is evidence against pathogenicity. And that's really where the value comes in. But evidence against pathogenicity doesn't necessarily equate to evidence for it being pathogenic just because it's not in NOMAD. So it's just clarifying my thinking. Got it, got it. And it's interesting that you, yeah, you note that. Though, so we don't, uh, the Richards that are rules don't always include uh, sort of the mirror image rule for benign versus pathogenic, right? We do for PP3 and BP4, the in silico rules, but for example, we don't for case control, which is, remind me, is that PS3? Four. Four, thank you. Right, so when, when the variant is much higher in cases than it is in controls, we say that's evidence for pathogenicity. Makes sense. There is no rule that says if it's statistically higher in controls than it is in cases, or if it's equal in cases and controls, that it is, but no, there isn't a, an exact uh, negative uh, benign PS4 rule. There's a similar one, which is uh, uh, BA, uh, BS1, is that it's present in, in apparently healthy individuals. So it's sort of the same, but it's not really a mirror image of PS4. So we probably need to work on that as well. So Andy's asking odds path of PM2, wondering what variants did you use as benign when, ah, yeah. So that's a great question, Andy. He wants to know what was the truth set that was used for the PM2 calculation? Um, <coughs> uh, to determine that it wasn't uh, useful? Uh, um, that's a crucial question. 
I actually didn't do that calculation. That was done by David Goldgar using a very large set of validated variants for mismatch repair genes, Lynch syndrome genes. And a lot of that is based on, they have a very robust uh, functional assay, which can uh, quite accurately classify variants in concert with a few other variables. Uh, and then you can ignore uh, population frequency because you have to ignore population frequency to collect a valid set. Uh, and that's what led him to that 1.05 um, estimate. Um, so uh, I think it was a really good set and David was the first person to do that uh, and bring that to our attention. And uh, here's a question from Shruti. Um, I'm wondering how the downgrading of PM2 or its, uh, its removal may affect other codes it's tied to. For example, uh, PM3 in trans with a pathogenic variant is applied only when PM2 is met. Uh, some of these sets also tie PP1 segregation data to PM2 being met. That's a great question. Um, you know, in fact, Shruti, you can continue to use uh, that as a criterion for another criterion. So you can say you can only use uh, the PM3 rule if the variant is absent or very low in NOMAD. That's perfectly fine to do for implementing PM3, but it's not uh, to say that you can use PM2 itself alone as a moderate criterion. So uh, you, you can have that. And for sure, uh, your rule, your example is a great one because there's going to be lots of common variants in trans with path variants in recessive disorders, right? And so you want to be sure that you're only counting rare ones so you can have it as a caveat for a rule, but not have it as a rule itself. Great, thanks. And I think one last question from Anjana. Uh, in our clinical lab at Illumina, uh, which offers tests for rare and undiagnosed diseases, we have a significant percent of variants that reach likely pathogenic by application of PS2, which is the de novo code, and uh, PM2 absence in NOMAD. Without PM2, it would remain a VUS. Yeah, great question. That's a great example of what I was referring to about uh, Heidi's admonition that we have to be very careful about removing PM2 because it's going to leave a lot of variants. It's going to downgrade a lot of variants if we don't properly adjust other criteria. And as we discussed earlier, I do think mathematically the de novo criterion, again, with a specific phenotype is going to be higher than we think. Um, and it may uh, get you to LP uh, when it is properly calibrated alone. Um, and, and it also makes sense, doesn't it, that if it was for a phenotype like autism, you would want to see some other evidence to get you to likely pathogenic, given that, again, there are hundreds of genes that can cause autism or ID, and just having a de novo variant in one of those genes may not do it. Uh, so um, I think in some cases, uh, de novo by itself probably should lead to um, uh, likely pathogenic, but in others it should not. Uh, and that's again that caveat that's in PS2, which I think is really important, uh, that the patient has the specified phenotype uh, makes all the difference in the world. Um, it does become a problem when you're doing secondary findings because by definition, you do not have phenotype information. And so some genes, and we'll have to be able to evaluate the evidence for this, for some genes it may be, and I think this, we're probably close to this with the HBOC genes, BRCA1 and 2, a de novo variant um, without any other criteria, assuming it's at a reasonably low population frequency, is probably a de novo loss of function variant, at least, is, uh, is uh, likely pathogenic or pathogenic. You don't need much more than that. But a de novo missense by itself uh, is probably not going to make the grade. Great, thanks for that. I think that's all of the questions in the chat box. Um, but maybe just before we go, um, does anyone have another question for Dr. Biesecker? And feel free to unmute yourself and, and ask the question. <laughs> 
Thank you. Well, Dr. B. Fair, I'd like to say thank you so much for being so generous with your time. Um, that really was a fantastic talk and really great to have all that discussion afterwards. Um, I think this has been really informative for our group. So really, really appreciate you spending the time with us today. Well, thank you all very much. And remember those peanut M&Ms. <laughs> Will do. Oh, and I see clapping hands from Andrea. <laughs> so, yeah, oh, thank you. Thank thanks you. Thanks for, for being here today. Okay, <laughs> so, thanks everyone. Stay healthy. Thanks again. Take care. You too. Thank you. Bye bye. bye.